about you, but I love hearing a good Jesus and me story and just a service that's been full of them from the baptisms to the testimony videos to even online, the social media posts that we've seen and to some of the stories that we've had, the, the opportunity to hear just from you personally has been great. And I also loved hearing some of the stories from those of you who rejoined us from Easter last weekend. Man, to see so many of you guys in your faces back for the first time, for, for some of you in months, and to hear the story about what Jesus has been up to in your life since then, man, it has been a joy. Hopefully you've enjoyed this series. You guys enjoyed Jesus and Me so far? Yeah? Well, don't get too excited. We're ending it today. All right, this is the last one. So grab your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 26. We are gonna look at the story that uh, is in Acts 26 of a guy named Paul. And I love this story because specifically, this is a Jesus and me conversation that happens after Easter. It's the, the conversation, Jesus has already, he's risen from the dead, we've experienced Easter, he went to heaven, but there's one more conversation he wanted to have, and it was with a guy named Saul, with a guy named Paul, whichever name you want to use. By the way, I'm probably going to end up using both of those names throughout this entire message. Uh, he has two names, and those names are interchangeable. Now, if you've grown up in the church, you may have been taught this lie, that uh, his name was Saul, and then he met Jesus, and he switched his name to Paul. That's not true, okay? He was always known by both names. Now, Paul was a good Hebrew boy, so he actually used his Hebrew name most of his life because he grew up to be a Pharisee, he grew up to be a religious leader, he studied the scriptures, he was an intellectual man, so he wanted to hold on to his Hebrew name Saul, but then he meets Jesus and it continues to call him Saul after he met Jesus, but he switches to using his Roman name, which is Paul, when he goes to Roman colonies and goes to the, the Greek world, he starts to use a Greek Roman name. So he always had both of those. So I'm going to interchange them throughout the story. Please forgive me for that. It's just growing up in the church, I always use Paul, even though in the scriptures, it's going to say Saul. All right. Now with this story, what I love about it is we're actually going to read starting with Acts chapter 26, which is later on in Paul's life. He is currently, in this moment, standing before King Herod Agrippa, who is the king of the northern section of Israel. He has been in prison for some time now. He has been persecuted for his faith and the things that he believes about Jesus. And he is trying to convince Herod that he is only guilty of preaching the name of Jesus. And King Herod actually wants to hear his Jesus and me story about how he got to this moment. And so Paul here starts to explain his story of how he got to meet Jesus. And he actually starts in verse 9 by talking about his blind opposition to Jesus. Paul's story starts off with him blindly opposing Jesus. And he says that in verse 9 by saying this. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I love his, his self-awareness here. He's like, I, there was this raging fury that was in my heart, and I used that against them to persecute them even to foreign cities. Now, Paul starts off his story by telling King Agrippa that, I mean, I was blind to opposing Jesus. I was convinced that I was right in my ways. I was convinced that this man named Jesus, who I saw crucified and die, that he was a blasphemer. He was claiming to be God, and I was convinced that he was only a man. And I was also convinced that his followers deserved to be put in prison and deserve to die for their blaspheme. And I was convinced that I was doing something good for God. I was convinced that the things that I was doing was things that God was asking me to do. And what we see is that Paul spent a lot of his life blindly opposing Jesus. 
And this opposition, it was an active opposition. He says that I locked them up, I cast my vote against them, I punished them, I made them blaspheme in raging fury, I chased them to foreign cities to try to capture them. He had this active opposition, and I think there's typically two kinds of opposition that we see when someone's trying to oppose Jesus. It's an active opposition and a passive opposition. Now, Paul, he was an active opposer of Jesus, and I'm guessing some of you have seen active opposers of Jesus. If you've spent any time on the internet, in the comment section of a Christian article or a Christian news story or something good about Jesus, you are gonna find people who are actively opposing Jesus. They are on a journey to rip apart the name of Jesus. They're on a journey to let you know how dumb you are and how ridiculous it is that you would follow after a person named Name Jesus when they know the truth and they are on this level high above you. That was what Paul was doing. That was Paul's first life. He wanted to actively oppose Jesus. But I also think there's another opposition that's passive. And I think that this opposition is probably what's mostly represented in the crowd today. And it often comes from people who actually follow Jesus as well. This is where followers of Jesus begin to oppose Jesus. These are the people who know that Jesus wants to do something, but they hold up a hand and say, hold on, Jesus, stop. Or hold on, Jesus, not yet. So the question I have is, as you sit here, could it possibly be that some of you might be passively opposing what Jesus is trying to do in your life, in your family's life, or in the world? I mean, that's what Paul was trying to do. Paul was trying to stop Jesus from advancing into the Roman world. Uh, Specifically, Paul was trying to stop Jesus from advancing into his religious world and into the world of uh, a a modern-day Jew in that time. Us, we're trying to stop Jesus from advancing deeper than we're ready to go, and we do it passively. I think some of you are hearing the voice of Jesus say, man, I want to take you deeper into who I am. I want you to... Step out of just going to church, and I want you to give your life over to me. But some of you are passively saying, hold on, Jesus. I don't know if I'm ready for a Jesus and me conversation yet. And we put up our hands and say, slow down, Jesus, not yet. Or some of you have family situations where Jesus wants to step into those family situations. Maybe there's a grudge that you've been holding on way too long in the family. Maybe there's some divisiveness between you and your spouse, and there's this voice that's ringing in your head. That's, it's, it's Jesus saying, you know, I can come in and let me bring reconciliation. Let me bring forgiveness. Let me bring justice. And you're like, hold on, not yet, Jesus. Wait and hold on. I think some of you, Jesus might be calling you out of isolation, and you're like, hold on, Jesus, not yet. I'm not ready for community yet. And that's what Paul was doing. He was blindly opposing Jesus. He thought that his way was right, And then he met Jesus face to face. And in the next part of his story, we see that Paul goes through this blinding reality of who Jesus is. And this is Jesus' blinding reality. It happens in verses 12 to 15. Paul's telling his story, as a reminder, he's telling the story to the king. He says, in this connection of me opposing Christians, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. Now, who's given him authority? It's the chief priests. You know who the chief priests are? They are top dog in the religious circles. These are the holy of holy people. And so Paul's saying, I'm going under the authority of the holy people, the people of God. What I'm doing, I thought was right. I thought it was godly. I've been given permission. And while I'm on my way to arrest some of these Christians in Damascus, he says, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven that was brighter than the sun that shone all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? And I said, who are you, Lord? I I find it interesting that he uses the word Lord there. He says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, now you get the picture of this, what's happening in your head here. Paul, he's, he's got arrest warrants in hand, heading to Damascus to arrest some Christians, when all of a sudden this light just bursts onto the scene. It blinds him to the point where he falls down on the ground, and the, the men with him, they fall down to the ground too, and he's just basically knocked off his horse. And he knows 
that it's because of something divine that's happened. And he has this belief that there's this divine representative who has just stopped him and who is now calling his name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But he's not sure who this is. And Saul, he's a, a man of the Old Testament. He's read stories of visitations of angels. And so maybe he thinks it's an angel. Maybe he thinks it's Gabriel or Michael. And he, he's asking, who are you? Because he's been knocked down. Now, I don't know if you've ever been knocked down by a divine representative. Or maybe, have you ever been knocked down by something that seemed to be a divine circumstance? Like a circumstance knocks you down onto your back and you know this might be God trying to send me a message. I don't know if you've been in that situation. For, for me, like 2020, that was a, a divine message from God to me, of God saying, Nicomas, slow down. Nicomas, you're spending way too much time on things that aren't important. Nicomas, you need to spend more time with your family. Nicomas, you need to spend more time in your word. And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that God caused the pandemic, but in that moment, I knew God used the pandemic to, to make me look up to him while I'm laying on my back. And I think that's what's happening to Saul here. He's laying down on his back, and he's asking this question. Who are you? I mean, you're calling my name. You obviously know who I am. You said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you? And I don't think Saul was ready for the answer that he got. He hears these words. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Not I am a representative of Jesus. Not I am a disciple of Jesus. I am Jesus. Now, what's the last thing that Paul knows about Jesus? Is that he was crucified and put in a tomb. And now all of a sudden he's blinded, he can't see, but he hears the voice of Jesus and Jesus is alive. And all of a sudden, that one phrase, I am Jesus, it begins to make him rethink everything that he's gone through. I imagine him going through what I went through whenever I watched the movie Sixth Sense. I don't know if you've seen the movie Sixth Sense at all, uh, but it's the only movie still to this day that I get to the end of it, and my mind was just blown to it. If you haven't seen it, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you, okay? Um, if you haven't seen it, then it's been long enough where it's okay to spoil it, right? He was dead in the end. All right, that's what, that's what the whole movie is. Like, you go through this movie, and you you're get to know this guy, and you get to see him go through counseling with his wife. You get to see him meeting a child. You get to see him going to work, having dinner. And at the end of the movie, you get this moment where a little boy tells the guy, you're dead. And he has this look like, wait, I've been dead the whole time? And I'm like, I have the same look. Wait, he's been dead the whole time? How did I miss this? There's like no way that he's been dead the whole time. And then so what do you begin to do? You probably did what I did. You begin to like replay the whole movie in your mind. Like, wait a second. Was he dead in this scene? Was he dead in that scene? And then that movie actually leads you through that and shows you he was. He was dead the entire time. And it rechanges the entire movie. And I believe that's what Paul was going through whenever Jesus says, I am Jesus and I am alive. I'm not just a divine representative. I am a divine child of God, the son of God, the Messiah who you've been studying your whole life. And all of a sudden, Saul has to rethink the entire movie. Wait a second, you're telling me the whole time, even when you were hanging on the cross, that you were the son of God. He has to rethink completely who Jesus was. And then he has to rethink Jesus' disciples, who he is going to arrest and charge and potentially murder. You're telling me that these people that I've been attacking and persecuting and imprisoning, they're not the enemies of God, but they are the children of God? You're telling me that these scriptures that I've studied my entire life, that I've devoted, to my, devoted my entire life to, you're telling me that that's you in those scriptures. And that voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then Jesus doesn't automatically like make him a Christian in that moment. He doesn't automatically give his life over to Jesus. But what Jesus does do is tell him his next step. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to go to the city of Damascus and wait there. He's essentially putting a blind Paul in timeout right now. He's like, you go to Damascus and you wait until I show up. And so that's what happens. Paul gets up, 
His friends walk him to Damascus. He's blind, and he stays there for three days without his sight. He's not eating. He's not drinking. And all he's doing is praying. You know, one of the questions we have is, as we read this, this story is, why did Jesus find it important to actually blind Paul in this situation? Couldn't he have just showed up? Like, what is it about Paul's eyesight that he would take that away? And some people would say, well, it's Jesus' way of emphasizing to Paul that he's actually been spiritually blind this whole time, where he thought he had all the answers, he thought he was doing good things, but he was actually spiritually blind to what God was really up to. And I think that's probably part of the reason, but I also wonder if Jesus didn't blind him and take his sight so that Paul couldn't read and study. That's how Paul interacted with God. It was through the reading and the studying of his words, and it was through this religious exploration. But in these three days, what we see Paul doing is he's not eating and drinking, which means he's fasting and he's seeking, not just studying. And he's praying, and I got a feeling that his prayers have moved from religious prayers to trying to discover who Jesus is. And now he can't read the scriptures, but now he has to rethink and think about and repicture and play over everything that he's always known. And I think in those moments, he's taken his sight away so that Paul has to just spend time thinking. And as he's thinking, a man comes up to him, a man that was sent by Jesus. And we actually read that man's story in Acts chapter nine. And this man was sent by Jesus to give Saul his sight back. And so in this, this next section here, we see that Jesus gives Saul a new vision. And it, it reads like this in chapter 9, verses 10 to 18. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And Ananias responded, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said, said to him, rise and go to the street that's called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come to him and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And now he's here under authority of the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Do you get this like little argument of interaction that Ananias and God are having right now? God is saying, Ananias, there's a murderer in town, and I want you to go meet him. And Ananias is like, he's come to murder me, God. That's why he's at Damascus. And they're having this a little bit of a battle, but Ananias is a follower of Jesus. He's a believer in God, and so he's obedient no matter what. And so God tells him this. He says, the Lord said to him, go, for Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. I like that he uses the word brother there, by the way. It shows a change in Ananias' heart of, I'm welcoming you in even though you have been an enemy and I've seen no change in you yet. He's saying, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you might, and he's gonna list two things here that, that he's come to do, that you might regain your sight, and secondly, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord has sent me to you that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And this is the moment where Saul's life changes forever. Where he goes on this journey from this moment on, after he steps out of those waters, his entire vision has been restored to him. And I'm not just talking about his physical vision, I'm talking about a vision for what his life is, for who Jesus is, and what his mission is moving forward. And what I find interesting about his conversion story and about this Jesus and me conversation is that there's, there's some things in there that I think that we can grab a hold of as part of our Jesus and me story as well. The first thing that God tells Ananias about Paul is that he is a chosen instrument, and that's his way of just affirming who Saul is. He says, Ananias, I know you think he's an enemy. I know you think he deserves to be punished. I know you think he deserves to spend eternity in hell, but he's actually a chosen 
instrument of mine. And Ananias had to have told Paul this. And that must have been so affirming to hear. Like, how would you like to hear from Jesus that, that you specifically are a chosen instrument of his? That everything about you, like your gifts and your abilities and your talents and your resources, that those aren't necessarily evil things, but rather you with those things have been chosen. And there's an affirming that comes along with that where, where Jesus looks at Saul and says, like, I affirm who you are and I think your talents and your skills are great. I'm not asking you to leave those behind. What I'm asking you to do is to grab a hold of those and take those on a new mission. And that's what happens next with Paul. He's not just affirmed, but he's repurposed. He says, you're a chosen instrument, but I'm not gonna use you to beat down the name of Jesus. Moving forward, we're gonna use you to build up the name of Jesus. I'm repurposing the kind of instrument that you used to be. And I'm still gonna use your, your, your morals. I'm still gonna use your ethics. I'm still gonna use your writing abilities. I'm still gonna use your zeal and your courage. But instead of using that to destroy people, we're gonna raise up the gospel in the Roman kingdom. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm gonna send you to the far reaches of the earth where nobody has gone yet to spread the gospel. I'm gonna send you to Roman empires. I'm gonna send you to kings. In fact, that's where Saul was right then when he's telling his story. He's telling it to King Agrippa. But what Jesus goes on to say is, I'm gonna repurpose you, but you need to understand that there's a warning that comes along with this. That success does not look like an easy journey. Success does not look like an easy path ahead. He says, here's what's gonna happen. I affirm you, I'm gonna repurpose you, and you're also gonna suffer for my namesake. That was part of Paul's calling to suffer for the name of Jesus, to make sacrifices for the name of Jesus. And I, I think it was important that Paul hear that because he was gonna suffer for the name of Jesus. He was gonna be imprisoned, he was gonna be tortured, he was gonna be beaten, he was gonna be stoned, he was gonna be whipped, he was gonna be shipwrecked. He's gonna be bitten by snakes and scorpions. And I think he needed to hear this right off the bat because if that were me, I would have taken that as a sign of I'm doing something wrong and I'm failing. Like, life should have been easier if God chose me as an instrument, repurposed me and sent me in a direction. Wouldn't he also make my life easier moving forward? What Jesus tells Paul, and I think he tells us, is when I use you, that doesn't make your life easier. It actually comes with the warning that life is actually gonna get a little bit tougher. That a lot of your life, you spent opposing me and people who believed in me. That opposition never ends. But when you join me, now you're partners in the opposition. And now you're not the oppressor, but now you become the oppressed. And that was a sign to Paul that he was actually fulfilling the mission of Jesus. But Ananias didn't just come to give him a new sight on what was ahead for him. He came to do two things. He came to give him new sight, but also he came to do the second thing, which was this. Fill him. Fill him with the Holy Spirit. Ananias, he says, I've come to give you new sight. And I, I don't think, again, it was physical sight, even though he did have his sight restored in that moment. I think it was a direction, a vision of where he should go. But that wasn't the most important thing that happened in that conversation with Ananias and Saul. He says, I came to give you new sight, but I came to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Because that's where the success of Paul's ministry would come from and actually did come from is that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You take Saul and all of his giftings and you take away the Holy Spirit, Saul fails. You take away like the, the, the mission and he was, had this drive and this pursuit and this new vision, but you take away the Holy Spirit and, and Saul doesn't succeed in his mission. The thing that made him a success is the thing that makes anybody who's chasing after Jesus a success. And it's not your own power, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And so here's the question I have. As we wrap up this series, as hopefully you've had some conversations with Jesus, the question I have is not do you have sight. I, I don't, I'm not asking if you've studied and you know who Jesus was. Paul knew who Jesus was. The question I'm asking is are you filled with the spirit of Jesus? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Because here's, here's the voice I hope that you hear from the Holy Spirit, that he affirms you. Like the things that he's, the blessings that he's put in your life, the gifts and the talents and the resources that he's put in your life, 
Like, that's a good thing. Those are good things. Now, you might be using them for bad missions, for bad purposes, but he can take those things and he can repurpose them for his own namesake. For instead of just building up your own life or building up your own career or building up your own bank accounts or building up your own reputations, that you build up the reputation, the name, and the counts of Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to do with you. But there comes a warning with that, that that often means sacrifice and that often means pain and that often means your reputation takes a hit. And all of that becomes worth it when you see the success of what the Holy Spirit can do when you join him in with it. I love, I love the way that, that Ananias phrases this for Paul. He says, I've come to do two things. He says, the Lord sent me to regain your sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 18, it says, immediately something like scales fell from his sight and he regained his sight. But it doesn't go on to say that he was filled with the Holy Spirit if you read that passage. But what it does say is, then he rose and was baptized. Now the assumption in the scriptures is that the Holy Spirit and baptism are somehow tied together and intertwined. And I know there's this big debate, and maybe you've even thought about this too, is like, when is someone filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it, are they filled with the Holy Spirit? Are they baptized first and then filled with the Holy Spirit next and immediately after that? When you look in the book of Acts, you see that happening a lot. People baptized and then filled with the Holy Spirit. But also when you look at the book of Acts, you actually see the opposite on occasion as well, where people are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then the very next thing they do is to be baptized. And so I don't know which one comes first, and everybody wants a formula of what's the exact right answer, and I think the Holy Spirit will do what the Holy Spirit does, to be honest with you. But when we read the scriptures, what we see is that these two at least seem to be siblings and near each other. They, they seem to be closely related to each other. That's why Ananias says, I'm here to re- help you regain your sight and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Then he regained his sight and then he was rose and baptized. I don't know where he's filled with the Holy Spirit, but all I know is his very first step in his Jesus and me story before he was changed was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the practical visual of that, baptism was tied in there somehow. That's why I love the way we started out our service of seeing all the life change that's happened, of people who have been baptized into Christ. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? I don't know. know. I don't know. Was it before that and that's what led them in the waters? Was it after that? I don't know, but here's what I know. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. So that's my question for you as we wrap up this series. Have you had a one-on-one conversation with Jesus where Jesus gives you your sight back, where he repurposes you and sends you on your way? Before you go on your way, make sure you go with him filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a song where we're going to give you the opportunity to pray and just give you the opportunity to start that relationship with Jesus in this moment right here. And I hope this moment is more than just a song. I hope it's more than just teaching and and reading the scriptures. I hope it's a conversation that you get to have with Jesus. And if you're online, I hope that you'll reach out to us and Uh, click the request prayer button. We'd love to pray with you about what it looks like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. If you're here in the chapel or in the mission cafe or right here in this room, we're gonna be over here on the left and we'd love to pray with you. And I'm gonna ask that you have the same courage that Paul had when Paul was knocked down his back, that he rose and took one step forward. And that's what I'm asking you to do right now is to rise and stand with me wherever you are. Everybody stand up with me. I'm gonna pray and then ask you to take one step forward. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you right now and um, we recognize that this, this moment is more, it's more than an item on our schedule. It's more than song. It's more than teaching. God, this moment here is where we get to experience the grace of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you knock down the walls that are in our heart and the, the passive oppositions that we've put up God, if it, if it needs to be this, I pray that you knock down us and knock us onto our backs so that we can more easily see up and to see who you are. God, my prayer right now is to that you infuse people with the courage, and I pray that it's your Holy Spirit that draws people into a relationship with you. We recognize that you are the one who takes the first step, that you are the first mover in any relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And so God, my prayer is that you move now and then give us the courage to step along with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. This is your time to respond.